Sonia Shah is an investigative journalist, author, and lecturer. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American, among others. Her books include Crude, The Story of Oil, The Body Hunters, Testing New Drugs on the World's Poorest Patients, and The Fever, How Malaria Has Ruled Humankind for 500,000 Years. In tonight's book, Pandemic, Sonia Shah discusses pandemics from many angles, as an historian revealing the history of outbreaks, including the causes of them and the personal and civic responses to them, as a reporter going where pandemics still directly affect people's lives, and as a sort of futurist discussing what we now know and how we can use this knowledge to predict and contain the next outbreak. So please welcome Sonia Shah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. So this is my fourth book, and it's my third time at this bookstore. And I think every time I've come, I have some deep-seated understanding that I live closer to this store than I actually do. So I'm always a little late. <laughs> so by my fifth book, I'm going to be you know, right on time. Um, <laughs> so when I first started writing this book about six years ago, I certainly didn't expect that we would be living through a pandemic of a novel pathogen right when it came out. But of course, that's exactly where we are with the Zika virus kind of washing over the Americas. Um, and I just heard the CDC report today that three out of the nine uh, women who were infected with Zika virus who came back to the United States have had abnormalities in their babies. So it seems like this thing is actually, might actually have some real virulence, like not just in Brazil. Um, but the Zika virus is just a really good example of what's been going on generally over the past decades, and it's, and it's the reason why I wrote this book, which is that over the past 50 years, we've had over 300 infectious pathogens either newly emerge or re-emerge into new places where they haven't been seen before. Zika is just the latest. We've had Ebola in West Africa, where it never had been seen before. Um, we've had novel kinds of avian influenza coming out of Asia, including one that last spring caused the biggest outbreak of animal disease in the United States history. Um, we've had novel coronaviruses like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a new kind of coronavirus coming out of the Middle East, um, and then, of course, all the antibiotic-resistant pathogens we have coming up. Um, and the mosquito-borne stuff, you know, we have uh, chikungunya, not just Zika, dengue, West Nile virus, a whole number of things. Um, so what I wanted to look at as a journalist is... Um, how does a microbe that, you know, it's just a tiny little thing that has no independent locomotion, <laughs> how does it become this kind of pandemic-causing pathogen? And so I decided to do that, answer that question in two ways. Um, first, I looked at the history of pandemics. And I picked one to focus on in particular, and that is the, one of the most successful pandemic-causing pathogens of all time, and that's cholera. So cholera has caused not just one or two pandemics, it's actually caused seven. Um, it kills half of the people who in, are infected with it. This can happen in a matter of hours, unless they're rapidly treated. Um, and the latest one's going on right now. It's just a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in Haiti. So I studied the history of cholera, and then I also went to places where new pathogens were emerging. Um, I went to South China. Um, Hong Kong, New Delhi, Port-au-Prince, and elsewhere to look at how the story of cholera could kind of shed light on what's going to happen to these other new pathogens. And what I found is that, you know, the history of cholera is, is really indicative of what's happening globally with all these other emerging pathogens, too. Um, cholera came out of the environment, like a lot of our new pathogens today. About 60% of our new pathogens today are coming out of wildlife animals and wildlife. Um, and cholera did too. It actually is a marine bacteria. It lives very placidly in estuaries, especially places like the Sundarbans in Bangladesh, which is where the, um, the major rivers of South Asia drain into the Bay of Bengal. It's a huge wetlands. And the water there is like half fresh, half salty. It's quite warm. It's quite alkaline. This is perfect for this bacteria to grow in the water. And it lives in conjunction with zooplankton there. And it actually helps recycle nutrients. It's kind of a helpful you know, uh, inhabitant in that environment. Um, and people for a long time didn't live in places like the Sundermans. This is a giant mangrove swamp. It's um, tidally flooded twice a day. 
there's crocodiles, <laughs> there's tigers, there's cyclones. But that all changed in the 19th century, of course, when the British Raj decided to chop down the Sundarbans and turn them into rice farms. So quite suddenly, over, this, over the course of just a century, 90% of the Sundarbans was settled. So suddenly people are in close, intimate contact with cholera in the environment. And that allows the cholera in the environment to spill over into human bodies and adapt to us. And of course, what it does in our bodies is quite different than what it does in the environment. So the first pandemic of cholera started in the Sundarbans in 1817, and then it started to spread into Russia, into the industrialized cities of Europe. And this is exactly what's happening today with our new pathogens. Um, we are invading wildlife habitat, or we're disrupting wildlife habitat. Either way, we're allowing animals and people to come into novel, intimate kinds of contact. And when that happens, their microbes can jump over into our bodies and become pathogenic. So from, e from bats, we've got Ebola and Marburg and Nipah and a number of other viruses, SARS as well, most likely. Camels are probably giving us Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. From monkeys, we most likely got Zika. From other non-human primates, we got malaria, we got HIV. From birds, we got influenza. So this is how they're emerging. And then we're allowing them to amplify in our cities, in our crowds. And that, of course, first started in the 19th century. And cholera took great advantage of that. You know, people were flocking out of the farms to come into these, you know, for these new factory jobs in the city. And there wasn't a lot of room to sprawl back then. You know, they didn't have metros that take you out to the outlying areas. So everyone had to live near work or near the possibility of work. So places like New York City in the 19th century had about 77,000 people per square kilometer. And this meant that they were <laughs> breathing on each other more, touching each other more. Their waste was contaminating their food and water. There's no sewage system in 19th century industrialized cities. Um, in, in New York, they had privies, they had cesspools, they have outhouses. There was no rule that you had to empty any of that stuff out. So people did what they did in the countryside. They just let it sit and try to decompose. But of course, with 77,000 people per square kilometer, that wouldn't happen before the waste actually ran into the streets, overflowed into people's wells, contaminated the groundwater. So as soon as a pathogen like cholera enters an environment like that, where it spreads through contaminated waste, it would just explode. So that process of urbanization, of course, that started in the 19th century is only reaching its peak now. So it's just a few years ago, I think, that half of humankind now lives in cities. That just happened a few years ago. The majority of us are going to live in cities by 2030. But they're not going to be cities like Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. They're going to be cities more like Freetown and Monrovia and Mumbai. Ad hoc, um, lots of slums, poor infrastructure, chaotic. About 2 billion people will live in slums. That's the prediction. And so uh, there's new pathogens taking advantage of this right now, this massive urban expansion in, in poor parts of the world in particular. Ebola is a really good example of that. Um, before, you know, we had Ebola outbreaks since about the 1970s. But Ebola never had infected a place with more than a few hundred thousand inhabitants before 2013. So it was only in 2013 when it came up in Guinea Within a few weeks of that, it had infected three capital cities with a combined population of nearly three million. So that's a really important reason why it was such a huge conflagration. And arguably, I think, Zika virus is also taking advantage of urbanization. So we had Zika virus probably since the 1940s, maybe even before that. But it was um, mostly in equatorial forests in Asia and Africa. And it was carried by a forest mosquito. And that forest mosquito mostly bit animals. They didn't, they didn't bite people that much. So people didn't really get a lot of Zika virus. But right now, in the Americas, Zika virus is being carried by Aedes aegypti. And this is a mosquito that specializes in living in human habitations. It can actually breed in a drop of water in a bottle cap. So all of our plastic garbage that we leave around in our urban areas are perfect environments for this mosquito to breed in, and they only bite humans. <laughs>
So as soon as Zika virus got into Aedes aegypti, it started to explode too. And Aedes aegypti has expanded rapidly um, as urban areas, especially in the tropics, have expanded. And then, of course, we carry these things around, right? We disseminate them. And that just started, that started in the 19th century, too, in earnest with the steam engine, where we started taking steamships across the Atlantic really quickly, steamships up and down all of our navigable rivers here in the United States. And then, of course, we connected all of those waterways by using steam engines to build canals. So by 1825, the Erie Canal had opened. That was just in time for cholera to come over from London and Paris into Canada into the waterways, down to New York City, and into the entire interior of North America. And that happened again and again and again. We do it much better today, of course, with our flight network. We have you know, not just a few capital cities with airports, but hundreds of airports and tens of thousands of connections between all of our airports. In fact, and this is a map I have in the book, um, you can make a map of all of the cities of the world as they're connected by direct flights. And if you run a, flu, a simulated flu pandemic on a map like that, it basically just looks like a wave, like a, like a, a pebble dropped into an, a sea, just expanding outwards. Because you can predict where and when an epidemic will strike simply by measuring the number of direct flights between infected and uninfected cities. So that's how influential our, fleet, our flight network is on the way epidemics spread today. So, so these are just some of the ways I talk about in the book how modern life really increases the risk of these epidemics and is driving pathogens into human populations. But the other part of the book is about what we do about it. Because, of course, we don't take these things lying down. We have defenses. We have political defenses. We have medical defenses. We have all kinds of things that we can do um, to fight back, to contain these pathogens. So it's very interesting to look at what happened in 1832 in New York, and I spent a lot of time in the book trying to kind of dissect that outbreak in particular. Now, in 1832, cholera came down into Canada, and the governor of New York sent one of his top doctors up into upstate New York and Canada to kind of do reconnaissance, to see what was happening. Is this thing going to threaten the city of New York? And he collected this data that um, has been mapped, and the map appears in the book. It shows a very clear picture. There's clusters of cases all along the Hudson River, all along the Erie Canal, and it, there's even a time series. You can see it coming down, st heading straight for New York City. Very clear picture. But nobody in New York wanted to quarantine the rivers or the canal. The canal is what had turned New York City into you know, kind of a backwater port, into the premier port of the country, turned New York into the Empire State. Right, so this is a huge part of the economy. Nobody wanted to close the waterway, um, which would have been the obvious thing to do, obviously, to protect the city at that time. And so Dr. Beck said, well, it might look like cholera's coming down the waterways. It might look like it's contagious, but actually it's caused by miasmas. So miasmas, of course, is a, this is a 2,000-year-old medical theory that Diseases like cholera and other contagions are spread through essentially stinky air, bad smells. That's what they thought. And they decided to blame those bad smells on the drunks, the poor, and the immigrants, especially the Irish in, the, in 1832. And this was violent. This wasn't just, you know, they uh, badmouthed them in the press. There was massacres of Irish workers uh, during cholera, cholera epidemics in, in the 19th century. So, now I've lost my train of thought where I was going with this. I think I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Excuse me, let me look at my notes here. Where was I? Oh, right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The doctors, the doctors. New York City, they didn't want to accept, yes, yes. Okay, because this is, this is actually, it's funny that that's where my mind quit because this is actually my favorite part of the story. Um, so they didn't want to quarantine the waterways. Um, and in fact, there were companies at the time that were distributing cholera-contaminated water, and they were making money doing that. 
So, so there's this, the slum in the middle of Manhattan called Five Points. Um, if anyone has seen Gangs of New York, that Scorsese movie, it was about Five Points. And that's where all of the, you know, the main, the worst parts of the cholera epidemic affected that slum. And it's because it was really crowded and it was really filthy. Um, and that slum had actually been built on what was once a pond. It's called the Collect Pond. It was the only source of fresh water on Manhattan for a long time. The pond had been, over the course of the centuries, filled up with garbage, and the slum had been built on top of that garbage-filled landfill. So the ground underneath the Five Point slum was like really low-lying, kind of unstable, unlike the rest of Manhattan, which is you know underlain with bedrock. Um, so the groundwater was very easily contaminated under this slum, of course, because there was no sewer system. All of the outhouses and everything were, you know, con all their stuff, all their materials sinking down into this groundwater. Well, the the state of New York chartered a company to deliver drinking water to the people of New York. And that company, instead of tapping upstream sources of water, that is the Bronx River at the time, which was fresh, the clean, they knew it would taste better for sure. They thought that would be, you know, that would cost too much money. So they made a decision sort of like what happened in Flint, Michigan, which is they decided not to tap the good water. They decided instead that they would sink their well in the middle of that slum. And they distributed that water to one third of the people of New York. And this was through repeated cholera epidemics. Now, this is the good part, is the person who kind of maneuvered all this was Aaron Burr, <laughs> Alexander Hamilton's nemesis and murderer. <laughs> On top of that, the company that did this was called the Manhattan Company. And the reason they wanted to save all this money is because they wanted to start a bank, which they did. It was the Bank of the Manhattan Company. And that, that bank still exists to this day. Somebody, do you know who it is? J.P. Morgan Chase, yes. Biggest bank in America. That is their early history. So, and I told that story in the book because I think we don't, we don't really look at the political and social drivers of contagion enough. And I think that's an interesting kind of turnaround from the past. You know, my last book was on malaria. And... You know, and we had a lot of malaria in this country, like from the 1600s through the mid 1900s, and we really got rid of it before we had solid biomedical solutions by changing our land use policy. Basically, you know, we um, we we started building dams, of course, but we had engineers and malariologists and scientists who were on the board of these dams to make sure that when we built those dams, we wouldn't extend the mosquito habitat. We changed our housing practices. People started putting screens on their windows, screens on their doors. We uplifted people out of sort of uh, poverty in rural areas, give them electricity, give them mechanization on their farms. This ended sort of the malarious way of life. We kind of built it out. And this was well before we had DDT or chloroquine or any specific drugs to deal with malaria. But then in the 1940s, we started developing these really specific you know, chemical cures. We, you know, we had penicillin, we had DDT, and this created a whole new kind of biomedical establishment that became extremely powerful and extremely, you know, potent at, at curing disease very effectively. And we sort of gave over public health to our biomedical establishment. And so what happens now when we have outbreaks of contagious disease we don't really look for the social and political roots. We, we wait for those epidemics to erupt, people get sick, and then we hope that we can throw sufficient vaccines and drugs at it to make it go away. And that can work in some cases. But what I'm trying to say in this book is that it's really not sufficient for new diseases. Because we don't, you know, when new pathogens come up, we don't have the vaccines all made up. We don't have the drugs. And yet these things can spread exponentially. So we're talking about exponential growth of untreatable disease. One example of this, of not looking at the social and political roots, is um, the dengue outbreak in Florida in 2009. So dengue came, came out, and it was really centered in Key West, but it was sort of in South Florida generally, um, in 2009. It hadn't been there in 70 years. And it was immediately attacked as, you know, this biomedical problem. 
attack the insect, attack the virus. And that's what we did. But of course, Florida, you know, the mosquitoes that carry dengue have been present in Florida for a long time. Uh, Florida has been surrounded by countries where there is dengue around. You know, that's not new. So there hadn't really been any invasion of virus and mosquitoes that needed to be attacked with this chemical onslaught. What had happened in 2008 was we had the foreclosure crisis. And the foreclosure crisis meant we had a lot of abandoned homes. And in Florida, that means a lot of empty swimming pools. And so when the rains came, these empty swimming pools filled up with water, and they became giant mosquito hatcheries. And no one was home to notice, and no one was home to let the mosquito inspectors in. And lo and behold, a year later, we have this unprecedented outbreak of mosquito-borne dengue virus in Florida. So I don't know if addressing the housing crisis would have helped contain the dengue outbreak in Florida, because nobody tried that. What I do know, arguably, is that the biomedical model failed. You know, we're continuing to have dengue outbreaks in Florida. It's considered now a permanent part of the landscape there. So what I want to say in this book is, you know, as great as our biomedical solutions are, um, if we can start to prevent pandemics, if we engage with the root causes of them, which are more often political and social, in which case it's not a question of waiting for the perfect cure, it's really a question of our own political will. Thank you for listening. I'll take questions, too. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm uh, halfway through <laughs> on my nook. I'm really enjoying your book very much. Excellent. I have a question about the Zika virus, because I think that came probably right after, uh, with the uh, your thoughts about political, economic, and every kind of treatment in terms of the Olympics. Uh, and and what, what uh, given, you know, your theories in the book, what would you suggest? Well, I think it's, it's a difficult situation because the, the argument that they're putting forward in Brazil of why they should have the Olympics and why people should come anyway is because it's winter there. So, and it's true that when it's dry and cold, these mosquitoes either won't hatch as readily because you need standing water for at least a week, um, or even if they do hatch, they won't survive for long enough to transmit the virus because that takes seven to 10 days, and it actually slows down if it's cool. Um, so it is quite possible that that, is, that that's a good, you know, that that is true, that there's gonna be less virus around. But at the same time, you know, we're living in a time of unstable weather patterns. And so all we would need really is a good rainstorm a week and a half before people started to come for um, the Olympics and some of that water to remain standing. Those eggs of the mosquito that carry Zika, Aedes aegypti eggs, they desiccate and they can last for months. Um, you just need a little bit of water and they, you know, they'll just come right alive again. So, so I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's, a risky, it's a risky endeavor. But at the same time, there's no stopping Zika. It is going to come. In fact, it is probably here in far larger numbers than we know. 80% of people who get it don't have symptoms. So what we're counting is the tiniest tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's even counting, you know, a lot of the people who even have symptoms probably just think, oh, it's a rash, it's a fever, they don't notice, and then they, they get better. It's self-limiting for most people. So, so what we're counting is this tiny, tiny fraction. So it's probably already here in a more widespread way than we know. Um, if you consider the fact that we have 15 or so suspected cases of sexual transmission already in the United States, if there's 100 introductions, supposedly there's 100 or so introductions of Zika virus into the United States, um, and then 15 of those have transmitted sexually, those numbers don't match up because sexual transmission is probably a pretty rare form of transmission. So most likely there's many, many more cases of Zika virus. So Olympics or not, it's coming, it's, it's going to be here. It's really just a matter of time before we see it manifest itself in, you know, in a more detectable way. So we're in D.C., so it's hard not to talk about uh, what our government's doing on these issues. Um, for 12 years, I was one of the leaders in dealing with um, infectious disease, bioterrorism. And um, since your comment, I mean, when a, uh, under um, Clinton and Bush, there were large staffs of the National Security Council uh, 
focusing on biosecurity. Uh, because there are 25 agencies and you've got to have White House control or you have nothing. Obama comes in, he wipes it out. Gone. It's not one of the 11 top priorities for the administration in terms of security. Not even on, it's not even mentioned. Um, and then under Bush, we had amazing efforts, million, uh, tens of billions of dollars, folks are trying to figure out how to get development of vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics. It wasn't very well designed, didn't result in much. All of that has been dismantled by Obama. Do you have any, and, and, and actually the, the, the explanation was that we heard, widely quoted, was um, Cheney thought it was important and therefore we don't. <laughs> right. That's what everybody, it right. was widely quoted. Right, right. Just what, you, what is your take of how it's possible, given that these are existential threats where a billion people could die? A billion people could die of, of an avian flu epidemic if it's roughly the same, you know, uh, lethality as the 1918. You could lose a billion people. Yeah, I mean, I and you could have to, like the, the movie mm -hmm. Contagion. You could have quarantines. You could have panic. How is it possible that this administration has essentially zero interest in this issue? I mean, I, th I think you've you've said it all, and I don't, I'm not sure you really had a question so much as a comment, which is you know, f fair enough, absolutely. Um, but I, but I do think that we need to do even more than that, really, because what I'm trying to talk about in the book is not just um, let's stockpile vaccines and let's have, you know, sort of experts. Uh, and we do need that as well. But really to get at the root causes to look at, um, you know, healthcare infrastructure in poor parts of the world. Like, do we have enough primary health services to people who are most vulnerable? Um, what are we doing about intensive agriculture and the, the health of our animals and our livestock? How are we regulating the way we use land? Are we, you know, we're breaking up pristine tracts of land all over the place. And those are, there's a lot of reasons not to do that. And this is yet another one, you know, that there's, these are reservoirs of microbes that could spill over into our bodies. So, so I think we need kind of an all, all of the above approach. And, you know, we need, we, we need the kind of expertise you're talking about for sure. But I would like it to be even a more kind of multifaceted um, defense strategy. Um, so as you probably know, um, D.C. has the highest rate of HIV in the United States. Um, so from from like a global perspective, what lessons do you think can be learned um, in approaching epidemics on a smaller scale? Because because D.C. has is like a epicenter of. Of, of HIV, of HIV. Yeah. and so how does that translate into yeah or, or are there any like correlations or like what can you learn from like the global spread of disease as it relates to a smaller population yeah I mean I think we see this in in the history of lots of contagions is that it's marginalized communities that suffer the brunt of it so when you have like a and this is such an interesting aspect of the 1832 epidemics in, in of cholera is that we had slums in the middle of the city and that was such a driver of epidemics because there's these neglected communities right in the middle of New York City. And that was something kind of new at that time. Because in the past, usually the poor people were put out on the periphery of, of you know, communities. Um, and with urbanization, the slums were starting up in the middle of the city. And that became you know, kind of an epicenter that would just, you know, spark out to the rest of the city again and again. And I think you know, and I think there's a lot of parallels right now, what we're seeing. I mean, even you know, Ebola is a great example where very simple interventions could have controlled that, but we didn't have anything on the ground. I mean, even, even soap and water could have helped control the spread of a virus like that, you know. But we don't have even the most rudimentary services for some of these remote communities and marginalized communities, and that puts everyone at risk. So, and that's, that's something I really... Um, you know, I think it's a really big lesson of the history of contagions. Hey, Zonia, my name's Scott, uh, and I work for a global health organization, mainly lobbying the U.S. government to focus more on health system strengthening in the developing world. Um, so I think it's it's not ridiculously hard when you when you take a given country that, and you know you know what's killing people in that country, like say in Kenya, where HIV and <laughs> malaria are really big killers. Um, it's pretty. It's it's not ridiculously hard to figure out. You know what investments you can make that will that will make the greatest difference to saving lives and and really have the greatest impact. Um, uh, 
but that gets a lot harder when you when you're looking at you know pandemics where you don't know what the disease is or when it will emerge or where it'll come from. Um, and you know this this sort of question of priority setting I think is really important because we're never going to have all the resources that we want. Uh, uh, and so we really need to set priorities. You know, should we invest in health system strengthening versus building up vaccines versus investing in labs? You know, there's a lo there's a ton ton of things that we could do on uh, to prevent pandemics. But I, I just don't 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 have a lot of ability to say you know which things are going to get are going to have the biggest bang for our buck. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I don't have an easier answer too. I think you're right. We need all of it. Um, to me, the most glaring the most glaring lack is is primary health health care, primary health services for poor people in remote places. You know, I was in um, Haiti during the cholera, you know, the cholera epidemic's going, it's been going on now for six years, but I was there a few years ago. Um, and we traveled maybe 50 miles from the capital, but it took about eight hours because this place was so cut off. But the thing that was so ironic is they weren't so cut off that they couldn't get cholera. So cholera had come into this village, but they were cut off enough that they couldn't get any resources to help them, you know, and that just, it, it just really struck me, this like uneven development where, you know, they had one pipe of water coming down from the hills that the Belgians had built like 20 years ago as an aid project and never, you know, gave them any support for uh, maintaining it. There was no services around. There's no resources around. There's no know-how to how to maintain this thing. So when I came there, this pipe of water that brought the sole drinking water to this remote community, it was supposed to be up on the a cliff and because there's so much erosion in Haiti it had slowly fallen all the way down to the sea level and you know the storms were coming in and just hitting this pipe they had about 32 holes in it and they had nothing to patch it up they were literally using cloth and just wrapping it around so the water was just dripping out and they just had this tiny trickle of fresh water coming into the town and that was all of the reason why they had cholera because everyone was getting buckets and leaving it out and you know when you only have a bucket of water, you don't give up eating and cooking, you give up washing as much, you know? So so to me, those really, really simple things like clean water and, and aid that's not, uh, that's, that's sustainable over time, empowering local communities. I mean, I think those are all kind of vague things. I'm not a policy person. I'm looking at how, how these things spread and what are the approaches we can take to help empower communities to come up with their own solutions? I mean, I think that's the, that's the hugest lesson of all is when you go into those communities, do we ask them, well, what do you think we should do? And do they say, well, you know what, I would really like uh, 500 insecticide treated bed nets. No, they don't. <laughs> you know, they say we would like better water into this town, you know, or, or whatever it is. Uh, I would like to thank you for this. Um, I'm from a part of the world myself where um, this problem is starting to um, develop for us, uh, although I'm from a different part of it, but nonetheless, uh, I'm talking about the Caribbean, right, uh, with Haiti as a, as a huge problem because of the tremendous uh, poverty there and marginalization. Uh, and I'm happy that you talked about the fact that, um, you know, public health issues and sanitation issues basically are more important than kind of medical issues for stopping a lot of stuff happening. But having said that, uh, yeah, two questions. The first question is, um, because I haven't talked about that, but I know that there's a, um, both, both from Europe uh, and from the United States of America and other, other developed countries, um, there are attempts to place people in the, um, in the tropics, in different places, Africa, is, for example, to try to figure out um, potential newcoming uh, pandemics and, and how to potentially track those things. Um, so that's the first thing maybe you want to talk about. And the next thing is the, this complexity of Zika that is starting to spread in the Caribbean also, uh, happening at this point in time, not in my island, but it's only a matter of time, St. Martin, I'm talking about the Ruben Cure. So, it's only a matter of time before it gets there also. Um, but there, there is a, a complexity coming out of Brazil about this whole issue of, you know, of the, the, the consequences of it for kids, right? That people are saying that, um, yes, uh, potentially for certain people with certain genetic profiles, right, this, this can lead to catastrophic consequences. The U.S. said 80% don't, sh don't show anything, right? But that there was also seemingly a problem that no one is talking about, right? That in a lot of these neighborhoods where a lot of this is happening, especially with the kids, right? 
uh, the, you know, the, the, the consequences for the kids, that these neighborhoods were bombed with a lot of pesticides and other type of stuff, right? And that, um, <laughs> is it Zika or is it Zika plus these other things? Or it's more these other, these other elements that were there that, that, that's led to that. So have you heard about that? And uh, I would like to hear from you, thank you. Yeah, so, so there's, there's been lots of alternate theories about why we've had this rash of microcephaly in Brazil. Um, some, some of them are easy to say, no, that's definitely not happening. Um, the pesticide theory, uh, to me, there's a lot of evidence that it's probably not the pesticide. The pesticide has been used in other parts of the world. There hasn't been any spike in microcephaly that we've noticed elsewhere. Still... Could it have been used differently in these certain places? Could somehow, because of cultural reasons or some other reason, could those people have gotten a higher dose or something different happen? I don't know. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's a mistake to dismiss these alternative theories as conspiracy theories. And it's just, I think it's a mistake to just dismiss them out of hand. I think that is what we, you know, I think that's sort of the conventional response, especially from sort of, you know, the global health establishment is to say, we, you know, stop spreading these conspiracy theories. But there's a reason why these alternate theories come about. And I think it's important to look at that. It's useful to look at that. And it, they come about because of a lack of trust in our, our biomedical establishment. And where does that come from? You know, if you, if you trace that back, and this is something I try to do in the book, I look at um, why were health workers during the Ebola crisis in West Africa attacked and slaughtered? Um, this happened during cholera epidemics too. Doctors were routine, they were stoned in the streets, there's mobs, they, uh, you know, um, burned down quarantine hospitals. And we've seen this again and again. Um, and I, th and if you, if you walk it back, you know, there are transgress transgressions that have occurred between the biomedical establishment and local people, and maybe through the best of intentions, but it's still there. Um, and it needs to be addressed. That lack of trust needs to be addressed. It's real. Um, and I think when we just dismiss people's alternate theories, we're dismissing the underlying feeling that they don't trust the medic our, our public health messages. And, and I think it actually makes it worse when we just say, well, you're stupid and ignorant, you know. And, and it's the same thing with the, vac the anti-vaccine arguments where people say, oh, those people are so stupid and ignorant. They don't get the MMR vaccine. Of course, it doesn't cause autism. We know we have evidence. And of course, we do. But where does that mistrust come from? You know, people are very frightened about um, industrial contaminants, about uh, chemical contaminants, about secrecy, and corporate secrecy, all of these things, um, corporate control of medicine. These are real issues that are worth addressing, you know, and are worth addressing why people feel they can't trust, um, trust these messages. And we need that. We need to do that work now because when some big pandemic comes, we really do need to trust our authorities. We need more of us to trust them. You know, we need to all be on the same page. We're not there yet. We have, we have a lot of pockets of mistrust and conspiracy theories that come up almost immediately. You know, with Zika virus, I mean, it was like within days there was the GM mosquito, the Monsanto, the, you know, there's all kinds of theories about why this is happening. Um, hi, I'm studying public health at George Washington University, and my concentration is environmental health science and policy. But right now I'm taking a class called The Social Determinants of Health um, and Behavioral. And so I would just suppose my question is, how would we work towards creating policy that would be effective in addressing environmental issues, but also perhaps at the root cause, like social issues, as you mentioned earlier? I mean, I, th I think that's a, it's a huge issue. Like, how do people experience disease and, and what does that mean about what kind of interventions they're going to, that's going to make sense in their lives? And this was a huge issue in malaria, which was the topic of my last book, um, where, you know, we were hatching a lot of plans to help people with mala in malaria countries that didn't necessarily match up with their own priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and bed nets were a good example of that, where we created insecticide-treated bed nets. It was a great idea because it was going to be cheap, it was going to be easy. You don't need refrigeration, you don't need clinicians, you don't need hospitals, you don't need roads, you don't need anything. These people can be in the most poor, deprived settings, and we can give them this intervention, and it will save them from malaria. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so we did that. We spent, you know, spread hundreds of millions of insecticide-treated nets around, and you know, and that was a huge effort. Uh, and a lot of good intentions and a lot of money and a lot of resources were spent doing that. 
And then they weren't used right away, right? Like uh, 20% of them were being used, something like that. Really low uptake. And then they, then they sent the anthropologist in. Well, what's happening? And people, you know, they don't consider malaria a killer disease in their lives. They consider it a normal pro problem of their lives. The nets are hot. The nets are square. They live in a round hut. The nets are the nicest kind of material they've ever had in their hut. So they're saving it for when their honored guests come to take it out. You know, all kinds of reasons that just weren't really considered, mm -hmm. you know, and it's because people on the ground who have the most malaria, you know, they think of it in a totally different way than the way we think of it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is immunity too. Like they have immunity to it. You know, if they, if you survive the gauntlet of two, the first two years of life and have your 12 episode of malaria and you survive that, then you have some immunity to it. And in your lived experience, malaria comes and goes. Mm -hmm. It's the way we, you and I think of the flu. So if we had a bunch of African scientists came, come over to the United States and said, you know, you people lose $40 billion a year from cold and flu. All you need to do is wear this little mask when you go to school and go to work for six weeks out of the year during flu season. It's so simple. We don't need anything fancy. We'll just give you all of these for free. Would we do it? You know, uh, <laughs> and we don't even wash our hands during flu season. I, I have sort of a, a question about the, the contrast between this book and Ted Koppel's book about... Um, doomsday events like massive power grid outages and Carrington events. So what are your personal actions that you have done to prepare for pandemics or, or what do you do in your daily life to avoid <laughs> epidemic disease? Uh, I, I do I do common sense things. I, I keep up with my vaccinations. I wash my hands, you know, and, and I try to stay informed because each pathogen is different. But I do believe we live in a microbial world and um, disease is part of our relationship to nature. And this idea that we should live in some kind of germ-free environment and never have this is really anomalous if you think about sort of the long history of humankind's battle with microbes or interactions with microbes. You know, we had the first antibiotics come up in 1940s. By 1980s, we started having HIV and Lyme disease and, you know, all these new pathogens came up that we couldn't really treat that well anymore. Um, so that period of time when we had, you know, this sense, and this was a period of time when I grew up, and I'm the daughter of two doctors, so I grew up with that feeling of, like, I, infection? Like, who cares? Like, I'll just take some antibiotics. Like, it's simple. You know, I don't need to live with that. That's not going to be part of my life. Well, maybe that was wrong, you know? And I think, I think we're going to have to adjust to this new reality as our antibiotics stop working one by one, which is already happening. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you to Sonia if you would.